Nigeria is grappling with uh, one of its most severe economic crises in recent memory, sparked by soaring inflation rates and a sharp decline in the value of the national currency, the Naira, against the United States dollar. The situation has sparked widespread anger and protests across the length and breadth of the country. Recent government data released on Thursday indicated that the inflation rate in January surged to 29.9%, reaching its highest level since 1996, primarily due to a significant increases in food and non-alcoholic beverage prices. The Nigerian Naira continued its downward spiral, hitting a historic low of 1,524 to the U.S. dollar on Friday, marking a staggering 230 percent depreciation over the past year. Um, in Ibado, the your state capital, you've took to the streets in protest against the soaring cost of food and the dire state of the economy, the wheel of placards bearing various messages such as, and food price hikes and inflation. The poor are hungry and tenable. Remember your promises, amongst others. Now, this demonstration is not a first. It follows a similar protest two weeks ago in Niger State's capital city, Mina, where women blocked the Kangungu axis of the Mina, Bida Road, and they were protesting hunger against hunger and the exorbitant cost of living. They held signs that read, no food, we're dying of hunger, and also they demanded improved living conditions and reduced expenses for the populace. Now, official figures from Nigeria's National Bureau of Statistics indicates a staggering 35 41% flu food inflation rate. That's quite high, but probably conservative because, however, anecdotal evidence suggests that the actual food inflation rate may exceed 50%. I mean, go on the street and see uh, for yourself. It underscores the severity of the situation on the ground. Joining us to discuss Nigeria's uh, food or cost of living in uh, protests, we have Ahmed Musa Hussein. He's a public affairs commentator. He joins us via video link. From Abuja, we also have Dr. Oshino uh, Ibrahim. Yeah, he's an investment and enterprises risk expert. Gentlemen, thank you so very kindly for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Right. Uh, what are the factors driving Nigeria's current uh, economic crisis, particularly, you know, what the factors driving the surge in inflation rates and also the depreciation of the Naira? All right, so um, I would like to liken the Nigerian economy um, to a roof that has been struggling to hold on its own and that has been actually supported by two weak pillars. And these pillars are, number one, subsidize and cheaper, cheaper um, energy prices, and then secondly, subsidize and relatively overvalued Naira. So these are the th two pillars that are actually holding the Nigerian economy. And unfortunately, um, uh, the present administration actually removed all these two pillars, and now the economy is on a free fall. So basically, um, I would like to also make it clear that Nigeria is not the only country that is going through, you know, a rising cost of living crisis. It has been happening, you know, in almost all the countries across the globe. Like if you look at the, um, in terms of energy prices, we have the food and energy um, crisis uh, since the beginning of the. Uh, Russia, Ukraine war. And then we also have, um, you know, when you look at the you know, global currencies, out of 143 global currencies compared to the dollar, I think about 80% of global currencies have been actually struggling, have actually experienced a decline in value compared to the dollar. So it is kind of global, but what we're experiencing in Nigeria is um, it's, uh, it actually even more uh, horrible in the sense that government policies generally actually some government policies inadvertently actually lead to the kind of crisis that we are currently in and um, i would like to say generally the global economy is a kind of zero-sum game countries actually compete the other compete for market share the other compete for investment they compete uh, for foreign investment for technology for skills and what have you and then every country now must have a strategy on how it decides to compete looking at its own structure and the kind of context that it lives in. And unfortunately for Nigeria, we have our own local peculiarities. We should actually, you know, expand the kind of context that we are living, which will now inform the kind of strategies that we are going to adopt. So uh, these adopting strategies, also what some people call actually neoliberal policies that are actually promoted by World Bank, IMF, actually have proven to be 
um, strategically flawed and, you know, not economically well-grounded. This has been happening, you know, since the days of SAP in the 80s, and now we've seen it with, you know, different administration trying to bring some form of new yeah. liberal, you know, policies and in the name of the regulation and what have yeah, you. Yeah, but what you, you're talking about, the, the, yeah, sorry to inter interject, uh, my brother, but you, you're talking the, about the Bretton Woods Institution, and yes, we know people normally say that these policies have not worked, you know, but, but some could argue that as it stands, Nigeria drove itself into this pit. And um, there's no other way than to look at these reforms from the you know, uh, uh, exchange rate reforms uh, to the subsidy reforms, et cetera, et cetera. At least leaving out things like job cuts you know, and retrenchments. Um, so so do, do, is there any other way to go about this than to do what some of these institutions are advising that Nigeria does? Yes, actually, the, the problem we have with Nigeria is uh, we have this culture of throwing away the baby with the bathwater. So whenever we have a problem, we say, okay, a subsidy, there is corruption in field subsidy. So the solution to us now, to the government, is not just to remove the corruption. No, it's just to, you know, you know just remove the subsidy altogether. And this is the same, the same thing we have with the Forex issue. We have a problem with, our, you know, some corruption with our Forex system. And now the solution for the government is actually to flood the Naira completely without looking at the fundamentals, without looking at our local peculiarities. So, yes, there is a better way to do this. And the way to do this is actually increasing efficiency. If you look at it, our major source of, sorry, of, of export earning, our major source of revenue, which is actually, look at what's happening with the crude oil industries. We do not have refineries that are working. Our refineries are not working. And look at the significant level of oil theft, you know, in the country. We have about one million barrels of crude oil being stolen every single day. Our production is down to about 1.3 million per barrel. When we have a capacity to produce as much as 2.5, so far below even our upper quarter. So look at this. So you can imagine the amount of, you know, foreign exchange that we, we are losing daily in the name of oil theft, in the name of other, you know, corruption and other inefficiencies. So instead of the government now, to address the root causes of the problems. No, it decides to say, okay, fine, we're ending all this, the subsidy because we cannot afford to pay subsidies. But at the end of the day, look at the impact on the poor, on poor people. And I would also would like to also mention that there's a lot of political support at the higher level. You can see state governments and other sort of political stakeholders actually supporting subsidy removal because the argument was that for the past um, like um, two years or so, NNPC has not been able to remit one naira to the federation account because all the money that the NNPC actually that accrues to the NNPC actually is being used to pay for subsidies. And so they decide that if the subsidy is removed now, it will translate actually to more money for states and even for the government at the federal level. But what use is money when it does not have any value? If now what the states are earning today will not actually do the job that it would that that, that the amount of money that they were earning two years ago can do because of you know depreciation right. and you know. The, the okay. deterioration in the living conditions. So, so, so uh, Ahmed Musa, how are ordinary citizens being impacted by, you know, these economic challenges? So actually, the the you know ordinary Nigerians are going through a very horrible experience and a very horrible and terrible you know experience economically. If you because if you look at it. Um, the, the, the incomes level actually have actually, uh, you know, floundered. You know, Nigerians, uh, you know, prices have gone up, you know, more than double. And then so still there's not any talk about, you know, new minimum wage. So ordinarily, if you look at the 30,000 naira minimum wage, it translates to less than $20 today. So you can imagine, you know, how Nigerians are actually barely solving. How are they they're managing to eke out a living from the little that they have? So rising cost of living, and, and this has direct implication on the security station in the country because when you have businesses closes, closing because of high cost of doing business, because of other and other operational challenges, when you have lots of you know unemployment, when you have people not earning enough you know to you know guarantee them a decent living, then you are in you are actually in you know inviting for chaos. And then a lot of people actually would now actually move to you know to other criminal activities or to make ends means. That's not a justification, but that's actually um, a very logical conclusion, you know, or a very logical outcome to the terrible economic conditions that Nigerians are going through. And uh, what, what are the implications for the country's social and political stability, especially, you know, bearing in mind the recent AFDB report um, that said the economic issues in some countries, you know, including Nigeria, uh, um, Ethiopia and others, will lead to social unrest? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah.
Yeah, that, that, that's quite possible. That's quite predictable because if you look at the Arab Spring, what actually drove the Arab Spring is actually the cost of living crisis in the in the in the in the Middle East, especially in, in North Africa, where into where where we have where actually the trigger was started in uh, in Tunisia. It was because of high cost of living, and then people have general dissatisfaction about the social, economic, and political outlook around them. So economic conditions would now actually set the ground for more political and social instability. You see pockets of, um, uh, you know, um, social unrest and protests that will actually translate to something big. We are not praying for it, but, in, but inevitably, if this thing actually continues, if the government does not put measures to arrest the situation, then definitely in Nigeria is going. I can say maybe the next uh, coming month or years are going to all go very badly for the country. All right, interesting. Uh, we've seen protests across the country. You know, in the likes of Ibadan uh, or your state, uh, we've seen protests in Niger State. You know, we've had pro pockets of protests around the, the country. Um, do you see these protests escalating, going beyond uh, the pockets to become a nationally? Uh, 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 participatory protests like we saw in Occupy Nigeria and, and SARS? So we're not praying for that, actually, but um, uh, the thing is, uh, if the government does not do anything to restore the company, because right now Nigerians actually have lost hope in the government ability to, you know, manage the economy and the government ability to improve this, you know, economy situation around the country. So if the government does not put in measures you know, to actually restore public confidence, to actually, you know, restore public faith in the economic system, then definitely we're going to see a lot of errors. We're going to see this errors from just some pockets of errors and protests actually um, spreading around the across the country. Mm. And that's going to be very, very bad, you know, for Nigeria's internal cohesion and broadcast, uh, you know, stability, because we already have our own, you know, different you know issues around insecurity that are happening banditry and you know catastrophe and kidnapping in the northwest yeah yeah both are resurging book around in the northeast you know some kind of um, separatist violence in the southeast so there are a lot of you know pockets of you know um unrest and chaos within the country so if you know this economic situation now actually push the ordinary citizens into some kind of protest or some must you know outcry against the government then we're going to see those you know those uh, other uh, insecurity issues now right. escalating to the level that our security um, agencies cannot be able to contain all right, uh, Ahmed Musa Husseini, Public Affairs Analyst, thank you so very kindly for your time tonight. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, we'll keep our eyes on this, uh, the protests, uh, you know, to see if they will uh, ex escalate to become uh, something uh, more than what we've seen them to be in the past couple of weeks. Well, that's the size of our package tonight right here. Hope you had a, a wonderful time joining us on the conversation. My name is Kofi Bartels. We'll turn tomorrow for more conversation. Good night.